Tied for the shortest series title in the history of television and cinema, it's a cold-blooded examination of fascism and its impact on freedom, the media, community, and family dynamics. It's science fiction, it's horror, it's incredibly realistic, but don't worry, because it can't happen here. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of V. Thank you to Sheath for sponsoring this video. Use promo code TOYGALAXY to get 20% off your order today. Listen up, troops. That goes for everyone upstairs and downstairs. Sheath have a new mission for you that might seem impossible. You've got to deliver the package cooled down, dry, and looking good. And Sheath is here to help with underwear that features separate compartments for maximum support and performance to prevent contact for long durations, which can build up heat and moisture, all wrapped in spandex with a designer eye-catching waistband that comes in a variety of themes, color schemes, and styles. Sheath underwear was invented by a U.S. Army soldier during his second tour in Iraq, where he found himself in a situation he wasn't prepared for. The heat and humidity coming from his friendlies. But you can complete the mission today by clicking the link below and using code TOYGALAXY at checkout, or go to sheathunderwear.com slash TOYGALAXY for 20% off your order. That's sheathunderwear.com slash TOYGALAXY, or just click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 20% off your order. Thank you again to Sheath. This video is about the 1983 miniseries, its direct sequels, and the merchandise related to it. We will touch briefly on the 2009 reboot, but it is currently on our list to be covered in 2047 when it's 38 years old, just like the original V is now. V is a science fiction franchise that kicked off with a two-episode miniseries in 1983, followed by a three-episode miniseries and a full 19-episode season a year later in 1984. It is a thinly-veiled warning about the ever-present threat of fascism that uses technologically advanced lizard monsters from outer space that can tear off their own faces while they hunt humans for food to keep it from getting too scary. It's just another day in 1983, which at the time was present day, giving the entire story a sense of realism, of immediacy. Suddenly, from over the horizons, all around Earth, a fleet of 50 massive unidentified flying objects appear. They establish their positions above prominent cities throughout the nations of Earth just before a formal introduction in New York City by the aliens themselves. The visitors have a slight vibrato in their voice. They wear sunglasses to protect their eyes from the bright lights of Earth, especially our sun, as we all should. That's just good advice. But otherwise, kind of boring for first contact. They come in peace, they look just like us on the surface, and you know, I think they look real snappy in those uniforms. They have come to Earth because they need our help. They have exhausted some key resources and need our help to manufacture some chemicals to help restore the balance to their world. So they have come to us, their space neighbor, just asking to borrow a cup of sugar. In exchange for our sugar, they will share the secrets of their incredible technology with us. They will help us cure diseases, refine fuels, clean the air, put hover engines on our cars, teach the military and cops how to make laser guns, all good stuff that we absolutely need and want, all absolutely violations of the Prime Directive. Once we accept their offer we can't refuse, at current face value, the quick slide into authoritarianism begins. Alien workers arrive at factories to start the manufacturing processing. Scientists are targeted as a danger to our new friends, the visitors. Because stories begin to circulate in the media about how scientists are conspiring to attack our new friends, the visitors. And scientists have been deliberately keeping secrets like the cure for cancer, for personal profit, for power. Who knows? With scientists. Meanwhile, a resistance is beginning to grow, much of it organically from normal suspicions about an offer that is too good to be true, amplified by the fact that it came from space aliens. Scientists are coming together because they understand that they are in danger, and they are joined by like-minded people who can, metaphorically, see what's underneath the surface. A television cameraman named Mike Donovan, who has made a name for himself as a war correspondent, gets a first-hand look at what the visitors really are and what their plan actually is after he sneaks aboard one of the giant spacecraft. His initial apprehensions are confirmed after he not only witnesses, but videotapes Diana, one of the leaders of the invasion force, dislodging her jaw and swallowing a guinea pig whole. 
Any lingering doubts he might have had are cast aside after he engages in a close quarters fight for his life with an alien whose face is fully exposed. Yellow eyes, green scaly skin, horny protrusions, and a forked tongue. It's all Donovan can do to escape before the reptile finishes him. <laughs> Turns out the visitors aren't here to be our friends. The chemicals are just being pumped back out into the air because they're actually here to, one, steal the water, two, force humans into being their soldiers, and three, eat humans. Anyone that resists will either be killed or reprogrammed. In an attempt to prevent their secret from getting out, the visitors quickly seize television as the powerful global communication medium that it is, enlisting a well-known, popular, and trusted journalist to be their face, their voice, to the citizens of Earth. The visitors, with cooperation of all the governments, impose martial law for our own safety. Scientists and their families and friends are required to register with authorities. People are disappearing. Prices of basic goods are skyrocketing. It's all looking terribly familiar to Abraham Bernstein, who survived the Nazi concentration camps of World War II. The Resistance hopes to recruit enough good people to fight back against the alien invaders, to slowly grow their numbers, to chip away at the overwhelming power of the visitors until one day a final battle will drive them back to the galaxy they came from or into the ground. V, also known as V, the original miniseries, also known as a title that was conceived before Google search existed, was created by Kenneth Johnson. Johnson was already an established writer, director, and producer, having written, directed, and or produced TV shows like The Six Million Dollar Man, The Bionic Woman, and The Incredible Hulk for Universal Television. Johnson left Universal and landed at Warner Brothers. Shortly thereafter, he read the 1935 novel by Sinclair Lewis called It Can't Happen Here, which considers how a fascist government in the United States could become a reality like it did in Italy and Germany prior to World War II. He developed a script that he intended to shop around as a feature film. While having lunch with his friend Brandon Tartikoff, the president of NBC, he mentioned the film project. Tartikoff was intrigued and, after he read it, suggested that it might be better suited for a miniseries, something with a bit more space to let the stories breathe and maybe lead to a full series. Johnson liked the idea of a series and loved having more room to tell stories about the horrors of living under occupation. Tartikoff had one more note, though. He didn't think the audience would understand fascism coming from inside the house, so he suggested that maybe the Chinese or, in the height of the Cold War, the Soviets could be the invading force. But Johnson didn't think either of those two countries could realistically maintain a long-term occupation of the U.S., but either of those were more palatable than actual space aliens. But when the president of NBC tells you to think about it, you think about it. After sleeping on it, Johnson realized that using aliens as a narrative device, he could have the best of both worlds. He could work on a more metaphorical level, all the flash and style and visual spectacle of a Star Wars to hook the audience while telling them the kind of stories he really wanted to tell. Stories about human emotion, relationships, and conflict. Tartikoff told him to go write the script. 19 days later, Johnson turned in 230 pages. Tartikoff read it over the weekend, gave it the green light with no changes, and placed the order with Warner Brothers. NBC was trailing both ABC and CBS in the ratings. They were looking for something to rally around, something big, and Warner Brothers hadn't sold anything to a network, so they were happy to get some money moving. Star Trek and Star Wars were both about to release their third films, leaving a window to tap into that audience and bring that spectacle home to the television experience. Both NBC and Warner Brothers were excited and wanted it done yesterday. This was going to be the most expensive four-hour miniseries ever produced for television, even though no one knew what the budget was yet. From Tartikoff's green light to Johnson's first action on set was two and a half weeks. Kenneth was able to hit the ground running with nearly his entire crew from The Incredible Hulk. They were working seven days a week, casting as they went. Mark Singer, fresh off his starring role as Dar and Beastmaster, played photojournalist Mike Donovan. Faye Grant played biologist and leader of the Resistance, Juliet Parrish. Richard Hurt played John, the charismatic leader of the Visitors. Jane Badler was Diana, the head scientist and battlefield leader of the Visitors, if only through her commitment to the plan and tenacity to see it through. And Robert Englund played Willie, the friendly Visitor technician who joins the Resistance. During the third week of shooting, they finally found out what their budget was. During the fourth week, one of the stars was murdered. Dominique Dunn was 22 years old, known for playing the role of Dana Freeling in Poltergeist, but she had also done extensive television work. She had been cast as Robin Maxwell in V and had already appeared in a significant amount of footage. Shooting was stopped for two weeks. All of her scenes were reshot with Blair Tefkin in the role, this time under an even tighter time crunch and the emotional pall of her loss. Kenneth Johnson dedicated the series to her memory. 
NBC and Warner Brothers spent a lot of money on V. It cost $13 million to produce and included a real-world viral marketing campaign. Propaganda posters espousing that the visitors are our friends were placed in high visibility places like train stations in big cities, posters like the ones that appear in the series, and just like in the series, they were revisited days later with a large spray-painted V, just like in the show. According to the character Abraham Bernstein, a Holocaust survivor and in-world poster tagger with an eye for graphic design, that V stood for victory. Victory over the visitors and oppression which he believed would happen one day. But for NBC, that V stood for very good ratings. Tonight on the NBC Sunday Movie, prepare for V, the most extraordinary miniseries ever made. A daring TV journalist struggling to uncover the startling truth behind the alien's visit to Earth. And a beautiful and brave young scientist fighting for the very survival of the human race. Together, they take you on a fantastic journey to meet the visitors. Prepare yourself for a television event that's out of this world. Prepare for V, next. NBC was finally able to pull ahead of ABC and CBS in prime time for the two days that V aired. It was second to only ABC's life's most embarrassing moments. Every journey begins with a single step. Everyone was predicting a V sequel or maybe even a full series. According to Johnson, the original idea was that the two-episode miniseries would act as a pilot for a full series. After the completed production, it was clear that they couldn't maintain the budget for a full season order, so Kenneth and Tartikoff agreed that they would do a three-episode sequel miniseries to which Warner Brothers said... No. Warner Brothers knew a full series would be far more profitable for them than another miniseries. So they compromised and ordered both. NBC would get a six-hour miniseries, and Warner Brothers would get a separate full series order. Johnson hired three new writers to help with the additional workload, but before they got very far, Warner Brothers called and said they wanted a different director. Johnson had written and directed the first miniseries. He was contracted to write and direct the second miniseries. Warner Brothers was already trying to cut the budget and were afraid that Johnson would be too concerned about things like attention to detail instead of the bottom line. Warner Brothers wanted it done fast and cheap. Get to the full series as quickly as possible. Johnson explained that it would be a breach of his contract to replace him as the director. Warner Brothers didn't care. Johnson called their bluff, explaining that if he couldn't make it his way, he wouldn't make it at all, and left the project. In 2008, Johnson said, quote, It was a bit like having a baby and giving it over to the foster parents you didn't know or trust. To this day, I've only seen 30 seconds of it and watched them make every wrong choice in 30 seconds. V The Final Battle is the six-hour, three-episode direct sequel miniseries to V that aired a year later in May of 1984. Johnson's contributions to the story are credited under the name Lillian Weezer. As the name suggests, the final battle sees the climax of the visitor's invasion, or rather the culmination of efforts by the resistance to strike a definitive, potentially fatal blow to the visitor's occupation and their existence. All of the key cast members returned and new characters were added, most importantly Michael Ironside as Ham Tyler and Mickey Jones as Chris Farber, mercenaries for hire working with the resistance. Like V before it, V The Final Battle was a ratings winner, reassuring NBC and Warner Brothers that a full, ongoing series was the right move, even with potentially diminishing returns. For Warner Brothers, the cost of The Final Battle would be offset by the amount of money they were going to save on the series. They were going to slash that budget in half. V made it to a weekly series just over a year after being given the green light. 19 episodes aired weekly from October of 1984 to March of 1985. The story picks up a year after the events of V, the final battle with the visitors fighting to regain control over the populace. And continuing to get help from willing humans, which is sadly the most realistic and likely thing about the entire franchise, that to save themselves, too many would be willing to sacrifice others to disease, to poverty, to hunger, to homelessness, and to space lizards. Warner Brothers carried through with their threat to slash the budget for the series, and the result was exactly what you think it would be. Not as good as when they had a budget. Stock footage was reused wherever and whenever possible. Characters are randomly killed off or just disappear. Kids who were allowed to watch V went looking for toys, especially since they had been shown in the first episode of the original miniseries. However, the toys shown aren't actual retail toys. The ship is just the shooting model for the production itself, and the figures are customs made from, I think, what is a Hasbro G.I. Joe grunt figure and most likely a heavily modified Scarlet. 
LJN did have plans to produce a series of action figures featuring Donovan, Diana with removable face, a visitor trooper, and Kyle, as well as a visitor shuttlecraft, a visitor jeep, and a resistance firebird. Prototype figures and vehicles were shown in a 1985 preview catalog, but the show was canceled before anything could actually get into production. But LJN was able to get a 12-inch figure out onto the market using some recycled bits. It features a wonderfully detailed cloth uniform with removable belt. Articulation is nearly identical to their previously released Michael Jackson figure, except that this one has a removable human face hiding a lizard head with an extendable tongue. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and that was it. There are some pieces that were in production and would ultimately be released under different names. The iconic Visitor Blaster was released by Arco as a generic laser blaster target game set, but also with Robotech and Brave Star branding. If you just gotta have figures, Lobos Collectibles produced a series of handmade non-posable tribute figures this year in 2021. They were modeled after the LJN prototypes. Only 300 three-figure sets were produced and they are likely long since sold out. Nostalgia will help fill that V-shaped void in your collection. In 2020 and 2021, Funko released pop vinyl figures of Mike Donovan in a visitor uniform, Diana, Diana Revealed, and an exposed visitor. The battle against the visitors was fought in the pages of a series of novels. The first novel tells the story of both V and V the final battle condensed into a single story. That would be followed by 15 more novels published through 1988. Early entries turned the focus away from the main characters on the show as there had been no writer's guide established yet. Many of the books take place in the year between the two miniseries. There were several books published about the making of V and the subsequent series. DC Comics produced an 18-issue V series from February of 1985 to July of 1986. The stories in the comics were supposed to be happening at the same time as the events in the series. DC attempted to acquire the rights to continue the series if and or when the show itself was actually canceled, but that also never happened. In 1989, Go Nagai, the creator of Mazinger Z, Cutie Honey, Devilman, and Grandizer, supervised a manga adaptation of the series. A V computer game was released by Ocean Software in 1986 that puts the user in the role of Mike Donovan on a visitor mothership, planting bombs in an attempt to destroy and escape before the whole thing crashes into the ocean. It's a repetitive, side-scrolling, puzzle-solving game that actually looks okay for the year it came out. There wasn't a lot of V-branded merchandise thanks to the short life of the series and its target demographic of teens to adults. That said, you can eat your lunch out of a metal Aladdin lunchbox and take out the day's stress against an LJN Visitor 42-inch butt bag. If those aliens are giving you trouble, hit them with Arco's Resistance 45er sound pistol and holster, and let your friends know about it on the Powertronic Resistance walkie-talkies. V the series was originally intended to run for 20 episodes, but it was canceled before the last episode was produced. The franchise ends on a cliffhanger just after the Supreme Leader orders an immediate end to hostilities. The Supreme Leader, who we never see, has learned a lot about humans in the past few years and thinks maybe we can all just get along. Good. Very good. Philip the Visitor and Donovan engage in a literal red versus blue saber battle, and Elizabeth the Human Visitor hybrid with supernatural powers who was born on Earth during V the Final Battle is invited to come back to the Visitor homeworld as a guest of the Supreme Leader. The credits roll just after we find out that Diana has placed a bomb on the shuttlecraft that will detonate just after the Supreme Leader's ship leaves Earth's atmosphere. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch called V the series, quote, a silly, loathsome mess. It must surely rank as one of the worst TV sci-fi experiments ever. What was once a pretty decent science fiction saga with good drama, humor, and suspense ends up becoming Dynasty with lizard makeup and laser guns. Executive story consultant David Abramowitz said, quote, the budget for the miniseries was about double what we had per hour, so that's what was really difficult. It's impossible to retain the quality of the show with half the money, half the time to shoot things, half the special effects, half the sets, half the characters, and half of everything. There was talk about a proper conclusion with a little more closure. Maybe another episode, maybe another miniseries, maybe the resistance goes back to the visitor homeworld. Maybe eight hours of people celebrating with the Ewoks. <laughs> Maybe flipping the script and having the visitors who were left behind held in camps all over the world who are then allied with the resistance fighting against the world governments, but none of those ever materialized. Four years later, and not many people know this, J. Michael Straczynski wrote a treatment for another sequel series called V The Next Chapter. It would have been set five years later following up on Michael Ironside's character, the mercenary Ham Tyler, who went to Chicago halfway through the regular series. Most of the series' regulars would have either been captured or executed, living in exile, or just dead of natural causes. 
v the next chapter would have allowed them to examine what happens when a new minority appears in a modern American city and not for nothing, but they also happen to be space aliens who briefly took over the world, enslaved humanity, and tried to eat everyone. Some of the pilot script is available online if you want to read it. Warner Brothers passed because they thought it would be too expensive. Meanwhile, V creator Kenneth Johnson was developing the television adaptation for the 1988 film Alienation about refugee aliens who find themselves a new minority in Los Angeles. A single season of 21 episodes, and then just like five more TV movies that aired from 1994 through 1997. V the original miniseries and V the final battle have both been released on DVD and Blu-ray. V the series was released on DVD. All three can be purchased today on Amazon Prime and possibly other services depending on where and when you're watching this. While working on the 2001 DVD release of the original 1983 miniseries, creator Kenneth Johnson had an idea for a sequel series that would ignore the events of both the final battle and the regular series. The original miniseries ends with the Resistance broadcasting a message into space, hoping to contact a potential third galactic party to intervene. It would take place 20 years later with the Resistance continuing to fight back against the Visitor occupation. It's a tough fight as so many humans still believe that the benefits of the Visitor invasion, like the cure for cancer, were worth the brainwashed slavery and potential to be made into food. As luck would have it, another alien species called the Zeti receives the transmission and arrives to help the Resistance turn the tide. But the enemy of your enemy isn't always your friend. Sometimes they are also your enemy, and the humans are left to deal with a new alien force that was clearly even more powerful than the the one they had. In 2004, Johnson announced his intent to produce a sequel miniseries. NBC was interested, but they wanted to remake the original miniseries before attempting to advance the plot any further. In 2007, Johnson announced that the novel was finished and talks were still ongoing with NBC about a television adaptation. In 2008, Warner Brothers went ahead with a full reboot, hoping to reignite the franchise for a new generation. With a script written by Scott Peters, the reboot started over with new characters, new situations. They put a whole new face on the entire brand. Johnson's novel was published in February of 2009. The pilot for Warner Brothers' fully rebooted V-series with no connections to any pre-existing V mythology aired in November of 2009 on ABC. Mark Singer appears in season two as Lars Tremont, a member of a top secret organization who just happens to know a lot about the new visitors and have been secretly preparing for them to attack. In 2018, Desilu Studios announced that a feature film reboot or adaptation, who really knows at this point, whatever it was would be directed by creator Kenneth Johnson, produced by John Hermanson, Barry Opper, Kenneth Johnson himself and Kenneth W. Johnson, no relation. Desilu Studios is the production company founded by Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball in 1950 that CBS was pretty sure they owned, but they had no knowledge of the activities being undertaken with the Desilu production name, nor the money that was flowing through from investors. Turns out a man named Charles Hensley was falsely representing himself as the owner of the trademark since 2013 as part of his technology company. He was charged with defrauding investors, and the option with Johnson for a V feature film, of course, expired around that same time. In 2019, Johnson announced that the significant down payment they have received from the fake Desilu allowed them to begin location scouting, commissioning concept art, and beginning pre-viz on the new feature film. After the fraud revelations, they continued to work on the film and were able to show some early footage at San Diego Comic-Con in 2019 to give the attendees a sense of the epic scale and scope, the new aesthetic, and the possibility of a revisit to the world of V. Kenneth Johnson hasn't given up on the possibility of more V in the future. V was born from a story that, at its core, is a timeless warning from the past for the future, to recognize the signs of creeping authoritarianism before it's too late. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We must all look not only to the stars for threats to our humanity and our freedom, but also to the world we currently live in, and to continue to fight even when all hope is seemingly lost. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very, very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started streaming on Twitch. Find us at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon or become a YouTube channel member. Let us know in the comments down below if you ever saw any iteration of V, and if you haven't, if you're interested in going back to check it out now. My parents didn't really want my brother and I watching V because it was a little too intense for a nine and a seven year old. Laser blasts and spaceships were fine, but, and I don't care how rough that scene of Diana eating the guinea pig looks today, it was scary as hell back then. Absolutely shocking. Kids talked about that series like it was an urban legend. It was the best possible marketing a series like that could have asked for. If you had nine year olds talking about it at the bus stop waiting for school, in 1983, you knew you had a hit on your hands. <laughs> right.